Can you please let me know now? I ask this question not to stop you from doing so, but merely to ensure that others present will be aware that this is taking place. No one is indicating. So let's uh, crack on with tonight's business. Agenda item one, apologies. No apologies have been received. I think we have full house. Consequently, agenda item two, there are no substitute members. And I'm pleased to say that at agenda item three, there are no urgent items for this evening. I'm just looking to see if we have any visiting members. Agenda item four, visiting members. Don't think we have any this evening. Agenda item five. Um, we should consider whether any items should be taken in private because of the possible disclosure of exempt information. We have no yellow papers, no part two items in front of us this evening, so I propose that everything will be in public. Is that agreed, members? Thank you. Agenda item six, disclosures by both members and officers. Are there any disclosures tonight, please? Again, for the record, I note that nobody indicates. Agenda item seven, disclosures of lobbying. I'll ask you if there are any disclosures, but it might be appropriate to note, I think, that we've all been lobbied by email, by calc, um, on matters relating to the agenda tonight. Agenda item 12, so we'll record that to be the case for all of us. Are there any other disclosures of lobbying? I see there are no others. If I may next move to agenda item eight. This is the minutes from our last meeting of the 7th of February. They are circulated with the agenda. I trust that you've all had an opportunity to review. May I sign those as an accurate copy? Is that agreed? Thank you, members. Agenda item nine, presentation of petitions. There are no petitions this evening. Agenda item 10, questions and answer session for members of the public. There are no questions from members of the public this evening. Agenda item 11, this is the committee work program to be found at page nine. I have a couple of things to draw to your attention in relation to this, and if there's any other matters to raise, we'll do so afterwards. Um, Mr. Cornell um, has contacted me concerning a consultation response to the white paper. Um, in brief, the response deadline is the 2nd of May. Um, and I think you're all aware that we're holding an all-members briefing on the white paper on the 20th of April. Um, there are matters that overlap between this committee and Community Housing Environment Committee. Um, it has been suggested that the consultation is fairly dry and technical, the questions that are actually asked of us, and one suggestion is that officers would prepare a response um, and ask the chairman, myself, and Councillor Mrs Ring for the other committee to cast their eye over it before it goes. So what I'm asking you this evening is whether you're happy that that is the way forward with that or whether you would prefer to see the response formally at committee before. Um, does anybody have a view on that? Councillor English. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Chairman. I mean, it, it, if it were possible bef before the deadline to see it at committee, that would be nice. But I, I, I um, particularly, it, 
given the importance, shall we say, of some of the issues here. However, um, if it is better that a response be sent on behalf of the Borough Council than not. So if it proves impractical, well, I think you should still submit it, but I would prefer it to come to this committee um, if, oh, sorry, both committees, if at all possible. Um, clearly, that may not be, though, because of the timetable. But just for information, my group has, is preparing a, a separate group response, but that's just for your information. So I think the logistical difficulty would be getting both committees to look at it. Um, shall we say to officers that if there is any very early draft of the response that might be available for our next meeting, which I think is the 11th, we would like to see it. But if it's not possible to prepare something, then plan B would be delegated powers of officers. And, but, but I'm certainly seeing one face that is expressing a strong preference to, to see something in advance. So an early draft for the 11th, okay. So we'll, we'll pencil that into the work program on that basis then. Uh, Mr. Jarman. Um, yeah, I'm sure that we can get something to um, our councillors for the 11th of April. Um, could we uh, structure it by themes? Because I'm just conscious there's 38 questions and uh, it might take a long time to, to decide if we get into, the, into that level of detail. And perhaps to say the ones that are directly relevant to this committee. Yes. <clears throat> Does that, and then it's for the other committee to make their judgment about their involvement and matters more directly relating to community housing. Okay, yes, that's very good. So we'll insert that into the work program. Um, I think also not on the work program as printed, Baltimore, Chelsea and Linton conservation areas that should be ready for the April meeting. Um, the five-year land supply will not be ready for the April meeting. They're the main points that I needed to draw to your attention. And I see that Councillor Mrs Prendergast is indicating. Did you want to speak? Thank you, Chairman. It's, it's on a separate item. And I really wanted to draw this committee's attention to um, something which is contained within our constitution and which I think should be added to our work program. Um, it's under the local code of conduct for councillors and officers dealing with planning matters. And paragraph 13 is focused on a regular review of decisions. Do you want me to read the whole thing out, what it says in, in essence? I, I think that would be useful, please. I, I think I should as well. It says, councillors should visit a sample of implemented planning permissions to assess the quality of the decisions. Such a review should improve the quality and consistency of decision-making, thereby strengthening public confidence and can help, can help with the reviews of planning policy, which is where this committee is, is um, important. Such a review will be undertaken at least annually. It should include examples from a broad range of categories, such as major and minor developments, permitted departures, upheld appeals, listed building works, and enforcement cases. Briefing notes should be prepared on each case. The planning committee should formally consider the review and decide whether it gives rise to the need to review any policies or practice. Now, I know it says annually, and we're coming to the first year of my time on this council, and we haven't had this as yet, and I do think it's important, and I, do, you know, and I, I, I realise that there is more than one committee involved in this. There's this committee, the planning committee, and obviously, um, it may extend to, to, to democracy. But I would like to see this coming, added to our work programme as a matter of urgency with an accompanying report to see where we're going. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn to Mr Jarman in a second on this. So there's a question in my mind where the Constitution refers to the planning committee, whether it means strategic planning or planning committee or in actual fact both. And I think I'm right in saying is that historically this would have been addressed by there was an annual field trip that took effectively a review role. Um, uh, Councillor English may be able to inform or, or if... The, the, the I'm quite happy to mention it. Uh, um, you're quite right. We had, an, we had two um, 
different approaches to this, um, one by river and one by land, shall we say, and that there was a very useful um, uh, number a study that was undertaken, and it was it was annual for quite a number of years. For some reason or another, when the training program was reviewed a few years ago, it fell off the back of the lorry, and it hasn't happened. Um, however, I would say that um, it, it, it isn't a matter for this committee. It is a matter for the planning committee and the democracy committee, not this committee. So I think we're probably indebted to Councillor Prendergast for drawing our attention to this and perhaps an appropriate measure would be to make a recommendation to the planning committee that they could bring forward the appropriate review through whatever method they see as fit. Uh, I'll come back to you now, Mrs Pendergast. Chairman, I, I understand what um, Councillor English is saying, but it does say local code of conduct for councillors and officers dealing with planning matters, and that is us too. I mean, I'm a member of the planning committee too, so yes. I'm sure when that comes forward, I will be involved in that. But, it, you know, it, it's, it's the line that says and can help with reviews of planning policy. So if it's guiding policy, then I really do think that this committee should have a role to play in it. That's my view. The others may not share it. I'll, I'll come to Mr. Jarman. Yeah, just um, yeah, I agree with um, uh, Councillor English. Um, in the past, um, uh, we used to have... Uh, what I'd describe as design tours to sort of judge um, both officers and councillors the quality of design. Um, but also, um, um, I do, uh, the, the national indicator of whether or not um, there's been a, a quality decision in terms of process is through the appeal success rate. And um, in the past, we've had appeal workshops where we've looked at about four case studies on different topics and sort of um, gone through the various arguments. So we could, um, it's up to the planning committee, I think, at the end of the day, but we could do both. Councillor Mrs Springett, did you want to comment? It's not on this particular topic. I've just got a question before you start okay, the main we'll, agenda items. We'll deal with this first then. So I think the point has been raised that literally the wording of the Constitution potentially does involve members of this committee also. Um, so perhaps not just the referral back to the planning committee. Um, perhaps we ask Mr Jarman as head of planning to put in the necessary measures to fulfil that requirement of the Constitution. Is, is that agreed? Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, now, Councillor Mrs Springett. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, it was just a question. Um, it's not a disagreement with the minutes. It's just a question. On the last item on the minutes, it was um, dealing with um, paper copies of planning applications going to parish councils. And it was just to say, I can't actually remember if we've actually got to a position on this, we, we tried to remove a delegated power and then we were told we couldn't. But what has happened with that item? Because I'm, I'm somewhere along the line, either I've missed out or it's, it's under the carpet and I'm not quite sure I, whether we I are I think I can probably with give an appropriate update on that. So uh, as per the footnote in the minutes, this committee does not have that power to remove that delegation. But the position is that the lead officer there has agreed not to proceed until he brings a report back to this committee um, to see what the alternatives could be. So I think we can be very reassured that our resolution created the appropriate outcome, even if technically under the Constitution it wasn't quite right. Councillor de Wigginham. Just briefly, you say um, that, that this committee didn't have the power to remove the delegated authority. Where was the authority delegated from? Um, I have looked at this. The scheme of delegation comes from full council. So it would require a resolution of full council to actually alter the scheme. Um, it's even more complicated than that because it's actually a shared service. So there's a joint delegation at play as well um, but putting that to one side the outcome that was desired is achieved 
Councillor English, did you? First of all, um, only two hours ago, I, I received, um, big, um, through the Kent Community Rail Partnership, um, the announcement from South Eastern Railways that they are um, do, carrying out the next stage of their consultation on the South East franchise, which is of some interest to members of this committee and the council. Uh, the closing date for responses is the 23rd of May, which does mean that we should have time to discuss it at, at committee. Um, what is more immediate is that the stakeholder meeting for Maidstone, um, and I will circulate this to members tomorrow, of this, uh, is on the it's on Tuesday the 11th of April from 1300 to 1600 at that well-known venue, County Hall. So um, if you can, members make a note of that, I will circulate that tomorrow. I would like to ask that the, the committee's agreement that this be placed on the work programme because I believe this is very important to the people of Maidstone. Okay, so in summary, it's a consultation that this committee would have an interest in and I think we're asking to see a response before submitted and there's so, one other thing that, that I did, um, you will remember uh, mr. chairman uh, um, I sent on behalf of my entire group and also some members of the independent group a request that we follow up our previous decision um, of the that there be pilot studies by this council on the 20 mile an hour speed limit issue. Um, I understand full well why it would, couldn't, didn't come to this committee, Mr. Chairman, because obviously with a uh, local plan, that, that's fine. And it does need some preparation for the report. Um, however, I don't see it appearing later on. So I just want to make sure it will appear because it is something that is supported certainly by 24, 25 members of this council, and that should be enough to secure a discussion at a committee. Okay, so two things. So just picking up that last matter, there was the um, consultation day that you mentioned. I just wonder if the most expedient is if you forwarded that to our committee officer and then we ask you to circulate all members just for awareness. Yes, and then the 20 mile per hour speed limit. Now I must admit that my recollection needs to be refreshed as whether we did look at that and put it back to PNR because there was a funding issue or whether we've yet to to look at it. Mr. Jarman, can you recall? I, I can't recall exactly, but like yourself, um, what I do remember is uh, that a budget was not identified and I'm still not aware of a budget being identified for a pilot study. Um, it is quite correct that we, we did not refer... I, I did mention just before, Mr Chairman, when you raised it before, we did not re to re re defer it or refer it to PNR, although that was mentioned in the discussion and in the notes made. But decisions are only those parts of those recommendations that are agreed, not whatever supporting text there is. And... Um, no such decision was made. The only decision that was made was that the council, that this committee agreed there sh should be pilot studies. It did not men mention how, why, where, or f anything. It's, it's precisely those details but I, that I, we are requesting the report on. Um, now, there may be a number of different options, and I'm not trying to suggest one t or t'other, or, or, or numerous ones, but I am saying that the decision was the decision that we supported pilot studies, this committee, we did not refer it anywhere else, and following that decision, I want uh, uh, the, the whole of the Liberal Democrat group and the independent members for Higher Action and Lenham want a report prepared setting out how it could or could not be advanced in, a, in the appropriate manners, and I don't think that's unreasonable. Because I think in actual fact this was originally a unanimous matter from full council supported by all groups that it would be considered here. Yes. So, and when um, it was considered it, here it, we decided a borough-wide scheme was inappropriate which was probably the right decision but that we would look at a, an urban and a rural pilot and 
that is what I'm asking for the report on. I'm not asking for a decision. I'm asking for a further report on a decision we have already made. Okay. So I think to conclude that, Vice Chair and I will review the minutes from that meeting and then ensure that on the work program is the appropriate report along the lines of what you've just suggested coming forwards. Thank you very much. Councillor Mumford. I did put my nameplate down once because I was quite happy with what you said until I heard all of these other things being added to our works programme. Um, the item Bournemouth, Chelsea, Linton conservation areas, the consultants had finished the work in 2015. It was ready to come to this committee the middle of last year. Um, it's been staggering along extremely slowly. I was expecting to see it at this meeting. We got a phone call to say it wouldn't be. It would be on the next meeting. It's gone out to both parishes. It's been consulted on last year. One of them is an extension to a conservation area. It's probably just a matter of process to go through here to be adopted. Can you please ensure it is on the next meeting? I, I think the only reason I really drew attention to it is because both Vice Chair and I at the agenda setting meetings have been aware of this and keeping an eye on it. And it merely was that it was not in the printed copy. So I just wanted to reassure you that it's not forgotten and it is coming. So thank you. Right, let's move on. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'd just like to ask on the, um, on the list, you've got the parks and open spaces. You've got one report coming to us about playing pitches, strategy and indoor built facilities. Um, I see that most of our playing pitches are in our parks. Shouldn't both those reports come to this committee together rather than separate? And also, we've been waiting on that parts and leisure uh, for open spaces now for over a year. I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, but I believe the delay is actually waiting for the report to come from CHE committee, the officers at that end. Um, and... and Sorry, HCL, Heritage and Culture. Sorry, my well, apologies, Heritage and Culture. Um, and again, the reason Vice Chair and I put it on the agenda is to actually make sure that it's not overlooked and it did entail some emails being shared with our colleague committee to, to bring matters forwards. I think we'll stick with the agenda as per the order, um, which will take us straight into agenda item 12. Uh, Sarah Anderton is going to assist us with this. Um, but before we start, I think I'd just like to focus um, our attention to the matter of the decision in front of us, which is simply whether we refer these modifications for the public consultation or not. It's not on the table this evening to discuss the modifications or propose any alterations. These are the modifications from the inspector and it's at a stage of the process that is outside of our control. We could choose not to do that, which would halt the process, um, but modification of the modifications is not the agenda item. But I'm sure Sarah Anderton will make that even more abundantly clear to us. Over to you. Thank you and uh, good evening, councillors. Um, this report marks uh, uh, the next and, and quite a significant step in the progress um, of the local plan. Throughout the, local, the examination process, the inspector has focused on whether changes are required to the plan to make it sound. In some instances, he's actually uh, directed um, or given his own solutions to issues of he, he saw as unsoundness or suggested specific policy wording. And in other instances, he's asked the council officers to provide that wording, which would address the matter of soundness. Um, the schedule of proposed main modifications, which are the changes needed 
at this stage in the inspector's uh, view to make the plan sound has been compiled over the course of the examination. Um, it's as a schedule, it's also been discussed at two specific hearings. A hearing on the 1st of December, we actually went through the schedule and the inspector suggested changes or amendments to the modifications that they stood at that time. And then again on the 24th of January, which was obviously after he'd um, issued his interim findings, he went through the schedule again in a public hearing and set out specifically where um, he wanted further refined wording. So it's very much um, his schedule of proposed main modifications. And they're set out in uh, Appendix 1 of your papers. Um, we wrote formally, at the begin beginning of the examination process, we wrote formally to the inspector asking him to do this very thing, to uh, recommend or to um, set out the main modifications needed, if he thought they were needed, um, to make the plan sound. And as Councillor Burton has indicated, because we've made that specific request, um, we can't now decide to accept some and reject others really it's a it's a black and white choice we either accept the modifications that he considers are necessary at this point or we decide not to go ahead at all with them and effectively um, the likely outcome of that process is that the plan would need to be withdrawn it really is that that serious um, so essentially what we're presenting is a, a, the package of changes which the inspector considers at this point he thinks he's going to need to recommend in order for us to have a sound plan. Um, the report does go through sort of the main issues that are addressed in the modifications, but just to highlight the key topic areas... Um, they reflect the changes to the objectively assessed need figure, which, as you know, the inspector has set at 17,660 dwellings for the 20-year plan period, and also the changes he's made to our housing land supply position as a consequence of uh, changes to the numbers of housing at, houses at the broad locations, um, the deletion of housing site allocations and the adjustment of capacity uh, of capacity of certain sites. And again, just to reaffirm, the effect of the proposed modifications is to secure the council's five-year land supply position as measured at the 1st of April 2016 um, and indeed to further strengthen it in, in the years ahead. Um, the main modifications underline the necessity for adequate, adequate transport mitigation, um, in particular measures that will deliver modal shift um, and how important that is to underpin the successful delivery of the local plan as a whole. In relation to employment, the main modifications give a lot more certainty and are much more specific about the locations where the new office floor space we need will be delivered. It actually gives specific quantities to specific sites, which the submitted plan didn't. In terms of air quality, um, we've recognised that this is gaining increasing significance with changes both at national policy level and also our own local strategies that are being progressed currently. Um, and in that respect, the modifications include a commitment for this council to prepare a development plan document on air quality. Um, so effectively, a, a local plan document that will look at that, um, that issue specifically. Um, in relation to the countryside policy, which is policy SP17, um, there are specific changes to that policy which affirm the limitations on development in the countryside to be implied in conjunction with other specific policies in the plan which relate to specific forms of development in the countryside. And just finally to highlight, um, and I know uh, members are aware, um, the plan, the proposed modifications now include a specific policy which will um, commit the council to a review of the local plan to be adopted by um, April 2021. Um, and, and a key reason for that is to secure our ho housing land supply um, in the later part of the plan period. 
so in effect, we are, um, we, if uh, the committee agrees, we'll be undertaking consultation on behalf of the inspector. And the process is guided by um, this document, which is the procedural practi practice in the examination of local plans, uh, which is guidance produced by the inspectorate themselves. And I think it's just helpful to highlight um, in that document just some um, principles that apply to this consultation stage. Firstly, it should be made clear that the consultation is only about the proposed main modifications and not on other unchanged aspects of the plan, um, and that these are put forward without prejudice to the inspector's final conclusions on the plan. Secondly, that all representations made on the main modifications will be taken into account by the inspector. Um, the main modifications are the ones that the inspector is reasonably satisfied at this point are the ones necessary to rectify unsoundness or legal compliance. Um, additional changes, which we've called uh, minor changes, um, it should be clear that they aren't before the inspector. Um, we will consult on a set of minor changes, which is a, an appendix in the report, which are changes... As, as their name implies, a more minor nature are either corrections, um, updating, uh, a consequential to another, uh, to a main modification. Um, and so they don't go inherently to issues of soundness, um, but we will consult on them for transparency, for clarity, in terms of people having a good picture of, of the changes that are being proposed to the plan. But it will be for the council and not for the inspector to consider the responses to those minor changes. Um, and just, uh, just a point of clarification, I've just noticed that there's uh, the recommendations before you on page 10 in relation to the minor changes, which is the second recommendation, um, it refers to the schedule in Appendix 2 and it's actually in Appendix 3. Um, in terms of the guidance, um, the inspector will not contemplate recommending a main modification unless any party whose interests might be prejudiced has had the fair opportunity to comment on it, which is the consultation we're now proposing. Um, the guidance says that the scope and length of the consultation should reflect that that happened at Regulation 19, which, is, uh, which we, will, we will follow. And... Finally, there's a general expectation that the issues raised in the consultation uh, in terms of the main modifications will then be dealt with through uh, written representations. That's obviously the expe expectation, but it's open to the inspector to hold hearings if the issues raised are of such significance that he feels he needs to hold it in a, uh, in a, in a discussion in a, in a public forum. Um, so, just to conclude, effectively, uh, as has already been highlighted, the recommendations are, are really seeking agreement to, um, to put the schedule of main modifications and minor changes uh, to public consultation. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very clear and comprehensive by way of explanation. Councillor Mrs Springett, you've indicated? Um, yeah, I've got... I, I appreciate that that there's not much we can do with this document. I've just got several points I want to make. First of all, is this the inspector's wording or is this our interpretation of the inspector's wording? Let, let's deal with that straight away. Who's, Mr Jarman? Um, as um, Miss Anderton said, the, um, the last uh, hearing was on the 24th of January and we sent our proposed modifications, our substantial proposed modifications to the inspector on the 31st of January, and basically he's accepted them. And he has, he's given them full consideration and he is saying, effectively, go out to consultation. Gonna work, oh, how are we going? So, these words have, or these changes have been worded by yourselves and gone out to the inspector. Yes, that, that's how it is. 
we had we had discussions in this room on various topics. Um, the the team um, put them together. Uh, responses, obviously, it's our own words, and um, it, as I said, it's gone back to the inspector. Okay. I mean, the reason the reason I'm asking is. Um, I'm just trying to find the exact wording now. There's, there's just a, a bit of wording that I just think needs to be stronger. Um, so I don't know whether I need to raise it now. It's on the document, page 43, on the great big document, and it's to do with Newnham Park. And it's, it's just in the first paragraph... The, or, down towards the bottom, it goes, in all cases, buildings should be designed and sited to respond to the site's undulating topography uh, and should avoid any significant site levelling. I, I think... Is that our wording or is that the inspector's wording? Because I don't think that's strong enough. Well, I, I think... So do I need to respond that, to that to the inspector? To, to be clear, I, my understanding is he has seen all of these words and he has consented to the consultation upon them. And yes, if, if you're picking up a, then a consultation response from yourself or others is the way to put that in front of the inspector for now. Okay, right. and another question, and it's, it's, a general, well, it's, it's a general question, is once we've got this through and it's adopted and it's cast in stone, can Mr Jarman reassure me that the officers will comply with the policies and the policy wording and the site criteria within the document? Um, the officers um, obviously have to um, comply with the local plan because it will be the um, up-to-date development plan. If, if behind that you're saying that, um, for instance, um, um, well, it depends on, on your exact interpretation of the policies, but yes, officers legally have to comply with that uh, document. So I think, you know, if, if the height of the building were an issue and an application was received by the planning committee that was, say, 10 millimetres taller, then it would be a decision of planning committee as to whether it was felt to be material. Is that a reasonable... Yeah, well... <laughs> You know, clearly, um, as required by the Planning Act, um, um, officers, everybody should um, comply with the local plan. But the, um, using uh, Miss Anderton's term, clearly not all the policies are totally 100% black and white. There is always an amount of interpretation, both for officers, for councillors, for planning inspectors. Yeah, sorry, and also you'll have conflicting policies. So you'll have two different policies which uh, the council members or the officers under delegated authorities have to balance. So yes, they will apply the policies, but there will be competing policies, and sometimes as part of that weighing process, we go one way or the other. Unfortunately, it's a policy document. It is not black and white. There's a lot of grey in planning. Thank you. Thank you. I've just got one other a very silly question. The document goes from SP18, which is a new policy, and then the next one is SP23, and there doesn't seem to be an SP19, 20, 21, and 22, and I just wonder if there was a reason. <laughs> very silly one, but I just wonder if there was... We've got new policy SP18, which I think is, is sustainable transport, and then there's another new policy SP23. I just wonder if, if, if that's a... Um, I think it's probably because there's some policies that haven't got any changes to them. So the schedule doesn't include every single policy, but just so you can see the complete picture of what the list of policies will be on pages uh, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, it actually sets out what the new list of policies in the revised local plan will be and so I think uh, where are we um, so 
So SP18 was the new policy on historic environment, and then there will be a policy, SP19, on housing mix, SP20 on affordable housing. So it will, yeah, there, there aren't any missing. Thank you for that clarification, Mrs. Prendergast. Um, I know the officer to my right has said a couple of times that this has gone to the inspector, but I'm just a little bit confused because I was fortunate enough to attend a lot of the local plan sessions, or some of them, and I've read the interim report, and there are some things that are just not making sense. Well, there are two questions I've got. Um, first of all, in the employment um, land allocation, he's, he, in his interim report, he says an assessment is therefore needed which updates the position on job targets and employment land provision in Maidstone and the adjoining boroughs districts within the same economic area, the wider economic area. Has that been, was that done and is that why? I just need to be absolutely clear on that because... I mean, that was largely um, one of the main reasons... If you could turn your microphone off. That was one of the main reasons for the bespoke uh, last year and on the 24th of January was to discuss um, employment. Um, it was basically in two parts. There was the sort of strategic angle that you're referring to, Councillor Prendergast, plus um, um, more specific um, matters around uh, Junction 8 and um, um, the uh, supply of office uh, floor space. Um, just to finish, the only other thing that I, there are obviously where there have been modifications or, or made, you know, major modifications, um, where there are applications already in the process, how will those be dealt with, which are yet to be decided, but in the process, where the modifications have, you know, where the numbers have been reduced, but the application is in, how will that policy work? I can think of one, um, which is MM25. On the, on the modification. So we're checking out. I mean, basically, the, um, the emerging local plan, as it is still emerging, is, is a strong material planning consideration. As um, Russell alluded to, there's other um, policy documents like the NPPF, um, our existing local plan, because it doesn't get superseded until this new one is adopted, but it does have um, a lot of weight. So planning officers on that particular site um, should be giving the do documents, um, yeah, a lot of weight. Uh, please, Councillor English, we'll come to you in a moment. You know, if an application has come in saying 300 homes and the inspector has amended that down to 150 but the application is in showing 300 how will that be dealt with is what I'm asking well, sorry, I was... sorry if the inspector has um, uh, reduced the yield uh, which I, I think is, is, is what you're saying then we've as officers, we've gone along with that. We've proposed the modification to that particular policy. So the, partic the particular site allocation policy should be reflecting the yield proposed by the inspector. I would point out, again, going back to our earlier discussion, that it's an indicative yield. I'm going to close that line of discussion for now because how it's applied is not the matter for this evening. Councillor English, you want to make a small... I'm sorry, I think the specific point that Councillor Prendergast was making is that the development control stage, before the modification has been consulted on, what weight do you give the modification as opposed to the original draft? And it was that question that you did not address, and that is why I was indicating. OK. But anyway, as I've said, I'm going to close that line of, line of discussion because... It's not what we're here to decide tonight. I'm not seeing... Oh, actually, strangely, because there's a clear side to them, you can't see them when they're at a certain angle. <laughs> yes, 
But yes, Councillor English, your turn then. Apologies, Mr Chairman. I was just anxious that Ms Councillor Prendergast's point was actually put as it stood. And I apologise if that was ultra virus for this evening. Um, well, we, some of us, many of us, I suppose, wouldn't you know, have had our reservations about the process, but we've come so far in the stage now and we are where we are in the process that we really have to proceed because otherwise we have to go back and endure this miserable experience all over again. And I don't think I've got the heart, the soul or the endurance to do that. I'm sure my constituents haven't. Uh, so I, I would, without further ado, I would like to formally propose the recommendations on the papers as amended to note that we are talking about Appendix 3 in Recommendation 2 as opposed to Appendix 2, and uh, so that we go to consultation on these modifications. And obviously anyone who has any issues should go direct through that consultation process. So the motion is moved as per the papers with the modification. I believe that's seconded, seconded by Councillor Mrs Grigg. I shall go straight to the vote. Those in favour, please. Those against and abstentions. That motion is carried. Agenda item 13, um, Maystone Park and Ride Provision Town Centre Parking Strategy. I'll ask Mr Egerton to assist us. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Members. Uh, members will recall at the last meeting that a report was presented on a proposed exercise to investigate bus interchange improvements in the borough, focused on the existing bus station. Uh, officers also introduced the principle of two other potential work areas, a park and ride study and a parking strategy. Taking this forward, this report sets out further information regarding the proposed park and ride study and parking strategy. Considering the park and ride study first, this will align with the integrated transport strategy, including to undertake a full and independent review of Maidstone's park and ride provision. The report also draws members' attention to a more operational commissioning review of the park and ride, which is currently being carried out to inform the decision on how the council should proceed with park and ride in the short to medium term, i.e. whether the contract should be retendered when the current contract expires, and assuming the council continues to provide the service, what the optimum service should look like. Therefore, the current short-term operational park and ride review will lead into the proposed strategic study, which is the subject of this report. Fundamentally, it will take into account current and future population increases, potential development and its implications, include, including highlighting opportunities for regeneration and redevelopment. In a similar vein to the bus interchange study, the overall output is intended to be the generation and justification of a preferred option or options regarding the future park and ride provision in the borough, including means of optimising service provision, usage and income. Turning to the Maidstone Town Centre parking strategy, this also aligns with the integrated transport strategy, with Action P3 seeking to optimise the level of parking space provision in the town centre, and includes a number of actions relevant to the park and ride provision in Maidstone Town Centre itself. This study would allow for consideration of what measures might be introduced to encourage long-stay parking into the larger edge of centre car parks and to establish whether there are any scope for rationalisation of existing provision. It would also need to consider a car, uh, car parks that are located on the edge of the town centre itself, but not contained within the town centre boundary. The strategy would use evidence that is held by the council, uh, although survey work could be required to assess the nature of car park usage and capacity, for example, and surveying may consider the extent of nearby on-street parking provision, which isn't subject to residents-only provision. The strategy would take into account and facilitate current and future developments in the borough, as well as current and future population changes, allow for consideration of potential future car park sites, provide evidence to support the delivery of housing allocations in the local plan that are currently car park sites, generate a preferred option or options regarding all future town centre car park provision as well as charges and usage, and, where possible, the intention is for the evidence and proposals to be disaggregated into parking types such as coach, car, short stay, long stay, disabled and resident permit. 
There was a clear overlap in all three areas of work, so the buses, the park and ride, and the parking strategy, and combining them will create significant potential savings. In addition, the production of an integrated single report should ensure clear consideration of multimodal journey planning and assess potential improvements to multimodal interchange facilities at a borough-wide level, including with rail services, and consider out-of-borough patronage, including inter-urban journeys. So this report asks the committee to instruct officers to undertake the parking strategy and park and ride stu uh, study concurrently with the parking interchange study and to resolve to consider a future report once initial findings of the bus interchange study, park and ride study and parking strategy have been established and preferred options have been identified for recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor English? Yeah, I, first of all, I've got a few, a few nit quibbles, um, probably because of difference in interpretation as to what we need to do um, from a member perspective and from the officer. First of all, um, yes, we may well need to rationalise parking, but I'm sure this was an oversight rather than, than anything else, or perhaps I missed it, but we may also need to expand certain car parking facilities, as they are a good revenue earner for the council. More particularly, we may need to expand uh, we would, no, we do. Let's be clear. We need a major expansion of, of, uh, of facilities for electric car parking. We, as part of the charging issue, we also need to look at some of the discussions we had at the air quality monitoring group around whether, we can, whether it is possible legally and technologically to look at differential charging from polluting vehicles. I'm not saying it is, but this is an opportunity to look at that. And so we need to be making sure those issues are flagged up. And, we, and just to, and clearly, I'm, I'm sure this must have been just your emphasis rather than an oversight. When we discussed this last time, we made it very clear that in terms, whilst the bus station and Maidstone East station, and to a lesser extent, Maidstone West station, our priority is obviously for bus rail interchange, we have very clear aspirations in terms of the Sutton Road corridor in particular for uh, encouraging bus journeys to the Southern Rail Corridor, which is a particularly good link to London and vice versa. We don't want large numbers of people trawling there in cars when they could go on a good bus service, for example. So this is a borough-wide bus rail interchange and other forms of interchange, not just the Maidstone Town Centre and members I think, and parish councils will be very disappointed if, it, if we don't continue to, to examine that very innovative approach, which I know the Staplehurst uh, ward members, for example, and of course Councillor Prendergast, who's here this evening, have been very keen to see developed, rightly so. Um, so I think that there's a lot of very useful things that we need to pick up. I'm not saying you haven't picked them up, Mr Edgerton, but I think there's room for a third recommendation as we discuss this afternoon to actually ensure that at a relatively early stage in, in the formulation of the report, there is an opportunity for members of this committee and substitutes in particular, but other council members as well, to actually sit down with the consultants um, and actually um, make sure that we've picked up these issues, that there aren't linkages that we've missed and that we're going forward. Because I think these two reports together do present this committee and the council with some major opportunities. But I wouldn't want to end up in a situation like we've had with so many consultants' reports that the consultants thought members wanted something we got so far down the road that it turned, then it turned out the members wanted something else. And when we had to row back and... So if there's a stage in here, which, which is fairly organic, so that we can actually incorporate... Um, I see Mark's... Make, Mr Edgerton, sorry, is making notes. Uh, so I'll let him come back before I try and formulate a precise form of words and, and have further discussion. But I think we do need to ensure a member involvement stage... Um, before we get too far down the road to a final report. Uh, thank you very much. Grateful to uh, Councillor English for his comments. Um, uh, overall, I, I think um, the integrated transport strategy um, seeks to optimise uh, parking, which gives the flexibility, I think, for reduction or expansion of car parks. I think uh, the Councillor is absolutely right. We need to be looking 
all options when it comes to future provision in that regard. Uh, and certainly, yes, I think uh, air quality is very important to the authority, um, and we are looking at various ways to try and improve air quality throughout the borough. Um, one of those ways is to look at you know, potential differential parking and so forth, and there's no reason I, that I see from an officer point of view as to why that couldn't be incorporated. And um, yes, in terms of um, multimodal uh, and interchange facilities, uh, the Sutton Road is, is very important. This is something which was uh, the subject of uh, many discussions at the hearings for the local plan um, and will continue to be subject to discussion, um, particularly with Kent County Council. Indeed, tomorrow night we will be looking at that and, and, and seeking bus prioritisation um, as part of the uh, Willington Street uh, um, interchange and uh, junction improvements there. So um, overall, I think uh, I welcome uh, the councillors' uh, views and, uh, and would leave it to the committee to to alter and change and make a recommendation as necessary. Thank you. I'd come to you in just a moment, Councillor Wigan, but I'd, I'd like to sort of continue that theme a little bit. Councillor English making the point that um, we need to perhaps meet with consultants before um, findings are firmly concluded. And taking that back a stage, so for example, we talk about optimising car parks and Councillor English did make the point that that may mean expansion and that is exactly what I was going to say and I just think that the word optimise doesn't convey that we're open to that possibility as well as, say, as saying it actually so can, can we just make that very clear to consultants that you know we're, we're not wanting a predetermined conclusion here and, and it might be the complete reverse of what we're expecting. Who knows? And in a similar vein, at 2.11 on page 190, where we're making it very clear that it would allow for consideration and, and that this should be taken in for alternative uses, I think that's a very leading steer. And I really would like that instruction removed from the report, removed from the count from the consultant's consideration. We want to know how well the car parks are functioning, whether they're fit for purpose, whether there's too much, too little, too expensive, too cheap. We don't want to cloud it with a, oh, well, we could flog this off and make a few quid. Yes, so, so I really don't think that reference belongs here. Uh, Mr. Jarman's waggling a finger and he's probably going to say, oh, you've, you've allocated the site and the local plan, but Mr. Jarman. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, just seeking clarification. Um, presumably, if um, members agree with those changes, um, logically, uh, they would want to see those explicitly in the brief um, to consultants. Yes. Um, okay. Yes. So I think we need to wrap this up with making that clear with the decision recommendation that we make. Okay. Um, totally endorse the comments about supporting electric vehicles in the car parks. Biggest impact we can make on air quality issues. And, and the other thing I would like to, that, that could be included in this, because I don't think that I've seen it properly set out anywhere, is a look back over the last 12 months of the effect of closing the park and ride at Sittingbourne Road, whether that was naturally absorbed into the capacity that we have elsewhere, whether other car parks are operating differently, but I would like an element of that particularly included. Mr Cornell. Yes, that's um, being considered in the internal work that's being done on park and ride, so that would certainly be picked up. Right. But I'd like it to be explicit in what we're concluding this evening. So, so they're my thoughts, and it followed on from what Councillor English was saying, but over to you, Councillor de Wigandon. Um, thank you very much. Actually, 2.11 was what I was going to bring up as well. Um, specifically, um, specifically the, the issue that uh, almost a presumption that, that, that we would have an oversupply. And a number of times over the last few years, we've had an officer's report say, there is an oversupply, there is an oversupply. And the truth is, when we're going to build 17,000 and a half homes, there really is not going to be an oversupply. And if we want to support the, cent the town centre, um, we've got to stop thinking that there is a permanent oversupply of parking spaces. 
just had a final, final thought to make sure that it will be included in the brief is the acknowledgement, of course, that we don't control all of the town car parks. So any measures that we would take in terms of modal shift or directional change, the effect is limited because there are private operators that can undermine that. So again, I hope that will feature within the, the considerations. Perhaps you'll, you'll be going on to this detailed chairman, but I'm very conscious um, in terms of identifying the budget, that are members looking for actual surveys of um, the usage of uh, car parks? I, Obviously, I'd, that has I'll attempt to answer on behalf of the, the committee here, and, and they'll shoot me down, I'm sure, if I'm not getting it right. If you're saying, do we need up-to-date evidence, the real facts of the matter out there, yes. I don't think we can rely on historical stuff that may be significantly out of date. So if that does mean spending an amount of money gathering current evidence, I believe we would be supporting that. Yeah, so I think there's consensus for what I've just said there. Sorry, actually when you said about the cost, uh, cost for actual surveys, surely that's quite an easy um, bit of information to get due to the fact that you have to put your registration into the machines now and get all that information. When you say surveys, does it mean actually putting someone there? Ones, but so it's it's not a comprehensive picture. Yes, you know some of the machines don't pick up that data. Hence my point about the level of detail one can go into in terms of surveys. And. and the amount of time that you pay for isn't necessarily the amount of time you occupy the space for. So there can be quite a large divergence between reality and assumption. Mr. Egerton. And, and just to follow up on that point, um, some of the sur survey work we might be interested in is the nature of the users, um, you know, whereabouts they're, they're heading off towards town centre or outer centre and so forth. So it's actually helpful to have on the ground look, I think. So a really good example of that is if everybody who parks in Maidstone East Car Park actually works in County Hall, it's clearly not the car park that you thought it was. Perhaps a supposition that needs to be tested through some, some real survey. So yes, we, we support some work around that. Now I think we put quite a lot of detail proposal there as to the scope of this. We could reenact that all again and encapsulate that in a a one-page recommendation, but I think we've got the webcast. I trust my friend to my right here to capture that point by point in the minutes. So can I suggest that rather than go through a absolutely specific recommendation that we refer to the discussion? Councillor English. What, what we would need would be to instruct officers to undertake, to amend recommendation one, to instruct officers to undertake the parking strategy and park and ride study concurrently with the bus inter study, interchange study, taking into account in the scope in the, the point set out in the following minute. If you're proposing that, I'm seconding. That, that's, a, that's the first amendment yes. to, to, to clause one. Um, I would like to also recommend an additional clause three, but at the appropriate, <coughs> but at the appropriate stage before the conclusion, before the um, preparation of the final recommendations of the study, that this committee and its substitute members meet with the consultants to review those findings. Do you mean actually within the committee forum, or would you like some kind of work? Workshop event. Yeah. With the with the consultants. So, if I may, that a workshop be held to review the evidence and findings before the final report. That would be recommendation three. So, on block one, two, three, as set out and amended, I'm happy to second. So that, that, so that an all-member workshop be held to review evidence and findings 
before the final report. As well, Ms. Harris, on the yes. Years. So that's moved, seconded. Those in favour, please. That's unanimous. Thank you, members. Now we're at agenda item 14 to be pay, found on page 194, planning performance agreements. And Mr. Chapman, could you set us running here, please? Thank you, Chair. Members, um, I'll be brief. The um, item on planning performance agreements relates to uh, reporting back on a pilot set up in November 2016 um, to uh, provide a project management process funded by developers for front-loading uh, evidence relating to the pre-application and application stage of major planning applications. Um, this process has been running, as I say, since November, and section 2.9 shows the examples of the pilots that have run thus far for PPA agreements totaling uh, just over £24,000. Um, the report then goes on to talk about uh, our experience of operating PPAs and uh, the benefits of doing so in addition to additional resources being brought in, um, the process of front-loading the evidence base and getting work done early on major applications, um, the opportunity of engaging um, uh, fruitfully at a pre-application stage with developers to get the necessary work done, um, and obviously strengthening incomes. The, um, the funding mechanism is outlined in section 2.3 of the report. Uh, it largely reflects uh, the fun funding um, used within the pilots um, with a couple of exceptions. Um, one relates to larger schemes, that's schemes of over 100 units, uh, residential units or 5,000 square metres of commercial. Um, that's at the top of page 196. Um, we are suggesting that we... Uh, keep to the fee level of £5,000 for these type of applications uh, with the addition of a sum to cover a formal design review process for such large applications, the idea being that we seek to uh, mainstream uh, a design review process to improve design quality on these important schemes. So that's an addition to the pilot. Um, secondly, medium-sized PPAs, that's 50 units plus. Um, that remains basically as previous, although they were called small. We are now introducing a new small PPA category. This is for, by definition, smaller schemes um, at £2,000 with a slightly smaller input. This is to reflect our experience that there is a demand out there for PPAs for those smaller schemes. And indeed, I think it reflects the market's understanding and appetite for PPAs working in a number of local authorities where these tools are already used, uh, both uh, as a source of income but also in terms of getting that early engagement and agreed project management format. Um, so without going into great detail, the recommendation which is outlined at the top of page um, 198, the different options in front of members, is to approve the introduction of PPAs based on our experience of the pilots and the associated fees put forward in section 2.3. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Mrs Prendergast. Thank you, Mr Chapman. That was a, a very good presentation. Um, this is a question from Mr Jarman. You've um, clearly seen this in Planning Resource magazine this week. Well, I picked it up online. And it seems to imply that we have already signed up to this, that our, um, the chief exec and the leader of the council have, in principle, 
already agreed to this. And I would just like you to confirm if this is correct, what I'm reading here. And, well, that's the first part of my question, and then I'd like to come back. Thanks. Um, uh, yes, indeed. Um, I'm part of the um, Kent Planning Officers Group. I used to be chairman, and you can blame me for starting this off um, in 2015. But it's um, a collaboration between the Kent Planning Officers Group. It's the Kent Housing Group and the Kent De Developers Group. And it's uh, pretty high-level stuff. It's... Um, focused on aims and goals such as a commitment, first commitment, we will ensure that appropriate resources are made available to deliver an efficient, high quality planning service. That's the, that's the first one. So um, it's not binding for any Kent uh, district or borough or the county council, but yes, um, the Kent council leaders group um, have endorsed it. Um, I think it was, um, I may be wrong on this, uh, Councillor Prendergast, but I think it was either late summer or early autumn. Thank you, Mr. Jarman, but that does raise some questions about why this is at this committee now, because if in principle it's been agreed, then it, it just raises a few issues. So the much two different things. Um, this is what I call a very high-level protocol. Um, for instance, the, the second commitment, there's four of them, the second commitment I quote is, we will promote training opportunities. And as I said, it's not just Kent planners, it's Kent developers are saying there's something of a skills crisis, so mm -hmm. let's get together to try and plug that gap. Um, uh, the third commitment is we will communicate effectively. Uh, last commitment, we will increase certainty and consistency, and we will monitor the protocol. Quickly, ha has this committee then seen that document? Because that would be effective communication too, wouldn't it? Because that would have... Just. There are many um, sort of documents that are produced um, camp wide. Um, there's another one called the Viability Protocol. I mean, on your point about um, planning performance agreements, I think um, Mr. Chapman can correct me, but I think they've been around for eight years. Um, what we have done rather belatedly is um, pilot them. Um, the difference, be the, me the simple difference between um, pre-application, um, the pre-application system and PPAs is that obviously a planning performance agreement is within a time envelope. And a planning performance agreement, unlike uh, pre-application correspondence or meetings, the PPAs continue once the planning application has been submitted, hence the link with project management. And in my opinion, there's a very strong link to what is being said by the government in the, in the white paper. I think the government are saying to local planning authorities that local planning authorities, in order to deliver housing, one of the strands is, dare I say, to get better at project management. So just to try and put some summary to that, I think what you're saying is this is a quite different document. It's a high-level, overarching document saying all the planning stakeholders in Kent want to do a job well, yeah, essentially. And then tonight, we're very specifically looking at a contractual agreement, if you like, between our planning department and possibly an applicant. So quite different things. So, so Councillor Mrs Prendergast, are you finished up? Have you got any more questions? Okay. Councillor Mrs Springer. Thank you. Um, I've got just three questions. I'll do them all 
one, one. Does, this, I presume, doesn't relate to someone trying to build one or two houses in their back garden, does it? So, it, it's, is it, if the developer wants it, basically, they can ask to do it, or... Absolutely. It's an agreement between a developer and a local planning authority to agree a timetable and list list of bits of work that both parties are going to do in order to progress a planning application. It doesn't mean that planning application will be approved. It simply gives a time scale, indicative time scale for how both parties will work together to get to a conclusion, and it is for large schemes. Um, my second part of that question then is, is member involvement. And I would like to ask that members are automatically advised every time one of these is requested by a developer so that the ward members have the opportunity to be involved at an early stage, if possible, rather than not know about what's going on, because I do think there needs to be a, a balance to discussions. OK. Uh, uh, can I, I was just going to say, on that point, would you mind if we park that for a moment? And, and I think what we need to draw out is the whether, in principle, we want these things or not. And if a yes, then we could actually cut in some detail. So if, if we're happy to proceed on that basis for now, okay. Uh, did, did you want to add a small comment, Mr. Just Jarman? Specific, um, in all the PPAs, there is a bespoke meeting involving members, which is different to the pre-application system. Okay, again, we'll... Come back to back to you. Just Council one Mrs. quick Springer. question on on the costings. I just wonder when it, when it, it says you can't do it as a profitable exercise. It has to be a not for profit exercise. Does that also cover the backroom costs of some little clerk sitting down working out? Well, we spent you've paid that much, and we've spent five hours on it, so we've got to refund you this much. Are the costs of the admin of it covered in the fees? The uh, PPA does include a small allowance to cover the costs of writing the PPA and the officer time involved with that. Um, it doesn't cover what a planning application fee would cover. It runs in parallel with a planning application fee. So that fee, which covers our sort of technical admin costs, if you like, still remains a, as a, se a separate element. I'm just thinking this introduces a, a new financial element in that they're paying a fixed fee up front, but if we don't spend the amount of time to justify that fee, if I've read it correctly, we have to reimburse them so we don't make a profit. Someone's got to do that sum and arrange the refund check. So I'm just saying there's a cost there, and is that covered under the, the scheme? I, I, th I think if I'm understanding it correctly, it, it's a fixed fee and that's it. Yeah, so there is no refund scenario. There is, there is no refund uh, arrangement. There is no totting up of the number of meetings we thought we'd have and whether we had them all. It's an indicative process, an indicative timescale. Both parties commit to working like that. Uh, it will, in my experience, having dealt with these in previous jobs, um, it will change on major schemes because timescales do change. And that process can be rewritten and the PPA can alter to reflect that. But the fee is not refundable and one doesn't go through it in the fine tooth comb to check everything was done exactly how it should have been. I shall indulge myself and then come to you, Councillor Mrs Grigg. I, where I want us to be thinking about this is a bit more of a, a fundamental principle about whether and I may be oversimplifying this and, and officers will come back at me, whether we actually believe that there should be a twin track system, that you can pay extra and we'll have a service level agreement, which as I understand it does set out what's expected on both sides, but does offer a time scale to achieve that. Whereas somebody who doesn't pay the fee will still have to do the same things, but hasn't got a suggested timescale. So that if you had two very similar applications, 
one with an agreement and one without, and you only had one officer available, well, which one will he do first? Now, that may be very much an oversimplification, but that's what I'd like to just draw out in pure principle, whether that's what we're looking at or, or, or it's a misunderstanding. C Councillor Mrs. Grigg, were you wanting to add something to that thought? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's sort of going on from what you're saying. I'm all in favour of anything that means efficiency within our planning service. And this may well be a very good idea. Obviously, it's been tried and, and tested in other areas, and it has proved to be. But I simply don't feel that there has been enough member involvement with this. And I'm, I'm sorry, but nothing should have been signed with the level of member involvement there has been. And I have reservations. I have reservations about... Um, an unrealistic expectation of delivery from developers for the very reason you're saying. I also have a reservation about a two-tier system and, and exactly what, what the chairman has just said. You know, of course, if you've got two exactly and one planning officer, we know which one is going to be looked at first, and that really worries me. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm just saying, as a member, I have not been involved enough, and I, perhaps I don't understand it enough. And, and I'm really disappointed that things were signed at that level. I think it's too early for us to, to agree this now. We haven't even sort of seen our planning review. And, and I think the timing is wrong. And, and as for sort of these, if you look at 4.1, the end, the committee have the opportunity to review the operation of PPAs, including fee levels in the future. If we're still monitoring, then it's a continuation of pilot. It's not putting it out, and, and that's certainly the way I'll be going with this. Councillor English, with your practical experience of planning committee matters. Yes, I think there is a total misunderstanding here, which does undermine, I'm sorry, underline Mrs Griggs' fundamental point that there has not been enough member involvement in arriving at this position. Um, this should have been discussed. I, I, I have said this so many times, I, I'm almost sick of saying it. Yes, Met officers had the power, technically, uh, to launch this. They had the right to do so without going through members, but they should not have been so politically, with a small p, insensitive, not to realise that this is subject to totally being misunderstood. And clearly it is being um, because there, is, there was a need to involve people, explain that this is simply a logical extension of a pre-application process that has worked extremely well for this authority and others. It, it, it would be just as logical to say that those developers who choose not to, and there are still many that do choose not to get involved in the pre-application process and pay the pre-application fee, are getting a second-class service. But it is their choice to opt for a second-class service. It is their choice to take the risk that the planning committee will throw out their application because there hasn't been a pre-application discussion. This is the logical extension of that process. Um, a couple of other points have been raised. I was, as Vice Chairman, Councillor Perry was there as Chairman of the Planning Committee, and all the local ward members and the county member, which is relatively unusual, were involved in the, pro in the discussion of, this, of the sites in North Ward at Springfield. They're very productive discussions. Not everyone will like the outcome, but they were, there were a lot of very useful discussions. I mean, there wasn't just one meeting, with bespoke meeting. There were three bespoke meetings involving ward members with the developer. So it was a very um, useful process. But I have to come back to this. It has been misunderstood and is being misunderstood. The planning, it should never have reached even a pilot stage without this committee's endorsement. And really, that's a, that is a situation that should not happen. I know the officers had the authority to do it, but the ability to misunderstand this as, um, um, because of the lack of information and involvement is epic, and clearly we've seen that here tonight. I'm okay. going to finish at that point and I say I do think we do need to move forward with this, but I have to say that should move forward with a, 
a process of information and involvement with members because right. to explain what this process is and how to get the best out of it because we haven't got that at the moment. So let's halt that there for a moment and see if we can actually clear up what is perceiving to be emerging as our misunderstanding. So I've set out perhaps how it could be misunderstood. I don't think I'm alone. Could somebody <laughs> put us straight? Well, I mean, there are a number of points made there. What I would say is, I mean, it, it is a pilot and we're reporting back on the, um, the experience of the pilot and there are a number of options available to members as a consequence of this yeah, report. Yeah, I, but not so much that, but there's a clear misunderstanding, I think, about whether it's a two-tier fast-track system well, or not. Let's, and, and with regard to the pilot, I do think, you know, I was given an assurance that the pilot was suspended yeah. until it came to this committee. And I think what's actually emerging is that perhaps it was not suspended. But, but the fundamental, is yeah. it twin, a two-class a two system or not? Well, I think it's fair to say that the payment of a fee for a PPA um, goes alongside an agreement of a timescale um, for the processing of the planning application. There is also, um, within the targets that we have for all planning application, an explicit timescale for processing the, that application. Every application have a, has a target timescale in effect, and the PPA doesn't change that. Uh, what the PPA does is uh, provide an opportunity to front load the evidence base to get um, the bits of work that are necessary to process the application done early, whereas potentially um, the lack of engagement at a pre-application stage um, would mean a developer was coming in, in cold, really, in bringing forward their proposal and having to have that dialogue post-application of what bits of evidence they uh, needed to submit. So I think a pre-application process generally makes, makes it a smoother um, process. OK, so we could offer a pre-app meeting, which was a guide to a successful application, end of. And we would... But, but this goes further, doesn't it? Because it's something that's contractually entered into. Well, two signatures on a piece of paper tends to give that feel, doesn't it? You know? <laughs> but, uh, and, and there's a timeline on that piece of paper which others don't enjoy. Yes. So, I don't know, Mr. John? <clears throat> they are two very separate things. It, it's not, um, you know a two-tier system, and, and obviously we, we still give general free advice as well. But leaving that aside, as, as you pointed out, um, with a pre-application discussion or correspondence, it is, it is literally that. A party is asking for um, professional advice, whether or not they're likely to get planning permission or not. Um, as part of that, um, often, as Russell said, you know, often in planning there's shades of grey. And in our response we sort of say um, the answer is probably yes if you do X, Y, Z. However, a PPA, as you said, Chairman, is much more of a contract. And an important part of that contract is this time frame, which both parties are signed up to. There's a lot around that timetable, but that's the, the essential difference. Yeah, and, and that's the nub of the issue. If you pay the fee, you'll get a timeline that you don't have if you don't. Okay. I, I think Councillor Mrs. Grigg, and then I'll come back to... But only because it comes back on this. Aren't we legally... Don't we legally have a time frame to fulfil anyway? Aren't our applications yes. have to be. So we have that time frame in place anyway. Sorry, if, if I can try and put it this way, a pre-app deals more with the principle of development, whereas a PPA sets out the road to get there and meeting milestones in getting there. I think they, they slightly, I can understand what you're saying, but I, I, if I had to put it in very simple terms, one is a developer turning up and saying, this is what we would like to do, what do you think? The other one is saying, 
we've done the pre-app, this is what we'd like to do, this is what you think, then the, the PPA says, well, this is the roadmap on how we get there. And it's, so it's, it's, it, there, there are two different things. I understand that, but we have finite resources and it comes down to a prioritization of resources that I just find it hard to believe that we wouldn't prioritize an application with a PPA versus one that hasn't. I, I'm gonna bring Mr. Cornell in next. Yes, well, the, the, the way I'd see it is that we're, we're, off, we're kind of offering a, a hand-holding service to show them the best route through the planning system and the best advice that they should be buying in themselves, external advice, which is gonna support their application. So it's really making sure the cost of their application don't bleed over and take up the resources of the council. We're being very clear saying, you know, you need X, Y, and Z, perhaps a, an external design review to evaluate this, and you're transferring that cost onto the developer. And I think to link this debate to um, timescales is, is wrong. That's not really what it's about. It's about hand-holding them through a kind of exemplar planning application. And I think that's probably what we've learned with the, the pilots, and, and that has been productive. Okay, lots of indications, and I, I've still got it in my head that on one side I've heard it's not a contract, and another side I've heard it is a contract, right? Um, Council will be. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to say that in, in industry I've worked in all over the world now, these kind of contracts are quite common. It basically ensures you get the product at the end of it you, you want. So as I think the plan officers have actually highlighted, this isn't so much about they get a fast track application, but it means that we explain to them that this is our planning, um, our local plan, and these are the policies in it, and these are what we'd like you to adhere to, if I'm correct as such, and that you, you do a sound development within our own policies. Um, now a lot of other industries use exactly the same kind of process to get the finished product at the end of it. Um, and they work better than you just having what we have at the moment, where you have the pre-application, it goes to the committee, and then we're generally asking, well, what, and then we're setting conditions at the end of it, rather than getting these stuff sorted at the front. I've been at plan meetings with, with yourselves, where that has all been, always been asked, why haven't we got this, why haven't we got that? I'll take this, this would take that actually out of it, and speed up the planning committee process as such, if that's my understanding. And, but just to emphasise, as Mr Chapman pointed out, it's to reach a decision, not necessarily a permission, a decision. Yeah, but yes, I think it's spot on in that the developers obviously are very well versed in project management and this PPA is something that they're very familiar with. I, I understand that as a broad overarching principle, but I can't get away from the fact that you pay a fee and I look at page 212, and it says, when you email us, we will respond to urgent emails within two working days. Now, without being flippant, I'm almost tempted to pay that as a counsellor to get some answers sometimes within two working days. So it must be a priority service. I mean, I wouldn't use those terms myself, as um, Councillor Springett um, alluded to. Uh, what it is, is say um, um, it's an application that um, Mr Chapman's dealing with, just for example's sake. The idea is, is to contact the planning agent or the house builder and say, this week my update is that the Environment Agency have commented and um, they... They, they find the, the proposal acceptable, subject to X, Y, Z conditions, or they object. It's, it's just literally to give um, an update. And as part of the overall costs, um, we're recouping that. Mm -hmm. But I would just say, look what it says on page 212. Councillor de Wigan. Um, I think I just want to get back to what exactly we are trying to do this evening. And I think we will conclusively prove that none of us actually know enough about, about this or have been involved in this. And I think that's, that's pretty straightforward. 
Um, but the, the option, the, the <clears throat> what's been asked of us is, you know, there is, there is a pilot, and do we want to actually continue it and have a look? I think what we certainly want to do, we certainly want to have a bit of a better look on this. Um, you, you thought, Mr Chairman, that the, the pilot was suspended, but apparently it is still going at the moment. We still have these which are, which are going along at the moment. Um, <clears throat> I, think, I, I think what we ought to be doing is, firstly, to know whether we are, we are doing this or not. Um, but the first thing is we need just to have a little bit more involvement in this. Now, maybe, you know, the decision is let's get on with these pilots, but we need to, but we need to have a bit more um, involvement. Or if we're really saying this really is, is far too early and we need to stop it um, until we've seen more, then I think one of those two things is a very simple, very simple question, isn't it? Right, well, can I just elaborate on... I thought it was suspended. Um, see, this, I think most of us sort of realised about these things for the first time when they were discussed at the developers' forum because it was announced, look, here we are, we've signed our first one. And then there's an issue of, well, how much do you charge for this? And, and my personal view is that if you are going to offer a premium service or whatever we're minded to think of it as, we should charge a decent amount of money. And I wasn't convinced that the initial charges were sufficient. So this actually came to us in a roundabout way when we were asked to consider fees and charges a few meetings back for the budget. And, and PPA fees were in there. And when I said, look, we haven't even agreed whether we've you know, agreed to have such things, so how can we agree the fees? That's when they were withdrawn, and I was told that there would be no new PPA signed. So from that point, that, so that's just the background. So, it's, so I think, and I, and I said this earlier, what we need to decide is whether we agree with the principle of them, and then we would perhaps move on to, and how much should we charge for them? And there may also be some fine tuning about what's in there. But we've got to start with the principle first, I believe. Councillor Mrs Prendergast. Um, Chairman, I, I think it would be really difficult to agree to the principle of it this evening because members have been really eloquent here. We simply do not have enough information. I would have liked to have seen more information on the pilot schemes that we've run. I know Mr Cornell has said it's a, it's a very good hand-holding exercise. Um, Mr. Chapman has mentioned timeframes, but we don't have any evidence of that here. And secondly, sitting on the planning committee, I have a real concern here how the two-tier system will impact on other applications, because at the last planning committee meeting, and Councillor English will back me up on this, we looked at one application that had been in the system for five years, another one for three years. I'm not saying they're all the same, but generally, you know, we know that we're limited in our resource and things don't talk. But we need a lot more information and evidence before we can even talk about principles here. But I, I would actually disagree that the principle you can talk about, because if you look at page 212, do you agree that somebody should have that level of service where somebody who hasn't paid the fee won't necessarily get it? That, that, that's my core issue you know it's it's like the nhs and private health care do, do you agree I, 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 really, I do really do think that if you take that if we take that absolutist thing we're going to have to stop all pre-application discussions because that's a logical uh, follow on from that um, position we're not talking about charity cases here we're not talking about Householder applications. We're not talking about a maiden aunt who, 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 who's being seriously disadvantaged. We're talking about major applications with developers who, frankly, can afford the fee and who are in a position where they can choose or not to choose whether or not to make the process easier for themselves and for us. 
There is no great moral issue involved. There, is a lot, there are a lot of practical issues involved, a lot of practical issues. I would say that in the case, if we had PPAs more uh, widely, we w it wouldn't just be the people with the PPAs who were getting their applications through quickly because speeding up the system and having more resources in the system will speed up everyone's planning applications. And that is a fact. That can I, I just, would say, Can I just finally, say something that nobody's actually said there are more resources coming from anywhere yet? It's well, just reorganising what we've got. No, that's not the case. That's not the case. It's quite clear that there is... that. All right. It's fairly clear, I would say, that, 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 that this would actually lead to a small in, um, overall increase in, in uh, resources and a larger increase depending on how much it goes. Some of that's time, rather, well, most of it's time rather than money, to be honest, but time is money in, in, to a large, large extent, whether in the planning system or elsewhere. What we... There are many advantages to this, but what, so what I don't think we can do is take an absolutist stance and say we're not doing it for some absurd moral reason which makes no sense whatsoever because it isn't, simply isn't like that. But what we can't do because of the sheer, because of the high level of lack of member involvement is do the opposite, I think. We can't here and now say this is okay. What I think we could do is and probably should do is continue with the pilots, analyse them in detail to see what the consequences actually are instead of us hypothesising and assuming what they are on both sides um, and see what the outcome is. But to continue with the pilot, we actually do have to officially set a fee if only for the pilots because actually otherwise we're acting in ultra vires because as far as I understand it within the council, we cannot actually... Um, set a fee without committee approval, even for a pilot. So, so I think that we, we really do need to correct that oversight because I don't think officers have actually got the, the power to set fees without it being determined by okay, committee, so even for a pilot. If that is the case, that is the situation we're currently in. In looking for some feedback from the pilot cases, it, it doesn't give us feedback upon my concern of how the comparative treatment of the non-PPA cases is. So we could see how successful a, a, a contracted application is, but will we know in all truth whether non-contracted ones were actually a little bit slower because that was prioritised. That, that's what I don't see well, how we're going to get from Mr. the Mr Chairman, I'm, I'm sorry, very, very briefly, it's, it's very difficult to measure a negative. It's very impossible. But other than measuring the outcome from the pilot and see pilots continuing and, and seeing what the actual outcome is as opposed to what we think it might be, I'm not quite sure how further we, can, we could actually go without... Make possibly making a very, very serious mistake uh, for, the, for this council. But I'll, I'm, if you go back 15 years ago, everything that's been said about the two-tier service was said by members of this council about pre-application processes. And everyone has seen what a great advantage it is to actually have robust pre-application discussions. If we'd taken the stance we're taking this evening, we would not have done any of that. Okay, I think we need to come to some conclusion. I'll give you the last word and then what I'm going to invite is a proposal from someone. As I, I'm going to start as I did last time. I'm quite honestly sitting here saying this could be brilliant for this council. That is not, that's not some, I'm not saying I don't want it. I'm saying it could be brilliant. What I'm saying is I sat at a developer's forum and it was the first I heard of it and, and I'm vice chair of strategic planning. Um, that is not right. And, and am I getting this wrong? We're not being asked here for a continuation of pilot. If you look at the recommendation, we are putting that the committee approves the use of PPAs and the updated PPAs fees. That's not being asked. It's, sorry, Clive. That's not being asked for a continuation of pilot. I just want to know more. I, want, I still think it's too early because it's before our planning review. 
we haven't had an answer to the scenario. We're saying we're not having a two-tier system. When, I've, when both the chairman and myself have asked the, the scenario of you've got one in front of you that's paid and one that hasn't, which are you doing first? No one's actually answered that, although we're saying we're not having a, a two-tier system. I also want to know is, until we've discussed the resources of it, what happens if everyone takes up this option and then we can't deliver on these expectations and these timelines? What happens then? Do we pay them their money back? I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm saying I don't know enough about it. Uh, Councillor Mumford, you haven't spoken, so... I'd like to ask, firstly, Mr Jarman has listened to the conversation tonight, do you believe you can bring something back to this committee that would answer um, the questions that are being asked, uh, do away with the confusion, and for legal, do we tonight have to set the fees or can the pilot carry on the way it is legally? So firstly, Mr. Jarman, could you satisfy this committee at a future meeting of their concerns about this? Can it be measured? It certainly can be measured. And as I understand it, one of the main issues for councillors is they want a lot of fine-grained detail. And yes, the answer is the answer to that. I would like to restart this pilot because I'm very conscious of the diminishing cost envelope. Um, you know, every year there, in my opinion, there's quite a high estimate set for um, pre-application income. Yeah? So, if there's a gap, at the end of the day, it has to be met from somewhere else. Another budget of this council, which ultimately comes from the taxpayer. I mean, perhaps, and I have raised it with easy. they see it as a very, very operational detail. It's basically recouping planning officers' time. The developer is paying for it, which, as Mr. In uh, Councillor English has pointed out, is one of the basic uh, principles behind pre-application correspondence. Unless we right. want to go back okay. to the days where so we didn't charge for that. I, I still can't get quite past page 2.1.12, but may, may I make a suggestion? Otherwise, I think we could be here all night. Um, we have the planning review on our horizon. We also have very recently increased fees by 20% across the board anyway, which must have some significance of impact. Well, we, we full, full council has, has agreed that you know, from that date, that's where we will actually be heading increased fees. So, so my suggestion, and, and you know, maybe somebody else will say the opposite, is that we suspend the pilot pending the findings of the planning review, and as part of the planning review, we have a proper explanation of how this would fit in with the reviewed planning department and what the revenue implication is in the context of of the higher fees. So that, that's where I'm at. Um, Councillor English, you're going to take a opposite. May or may not take some time. Um, but this is, a, this is an issue of considerable complexity as far as members view it, certainly. Um, I think no, I am very strongly of the view that, that the recommendation can't stand as it is. What I would like to see happen is that be replaced by a recommendation that the, that the pilot studies do continue and a fee be set for the pilot studies, but only the pilot studies and to set a time limit on that to report back to, to this committee in full as to what the effects of that have been on that specific item. I mean, if it gets... Not, the planning review is, is a massive piece of work. Okay, can and I cut in and just ask... it's enough Catherine, without when, putting the two things together. When you say the pilots continue, I would take it as a given that the four that are currently signed up mm. 
have to continue. Yes. If that's the extent of the pilot, yes, but that no further PPAs be signed. I think we should authorise a, limit, a strictly limited pilot to, um, carrying forward over the next few months. The, the, the four that we have, or you suggesting well, beyond that? Well, um, at least one of them has actually gone to committee and has a, had a decision, so uh, I wouldn't imagine that that needs to continue very much longer because it's actually been determined. But, um, no, I, I think we should try and set a small-scale continuing pilot, three or four at the most, to, to actually determine what the outcome is likely to be. Because otherwise, we will have this conversation again in six months' time, and we will be none the wiser, because the planning review will not be able to um, give us the answers without any information to go on. Take Mr Cornell first, and then Mr Chapman, I think. Yes, um, personally I think it would be a good idea if, if that's the route we're going to go down, not to limit to, it to just the four that are going at the moment, but to give the officers a bit more scope to perhaps double that number to eight, give us more to work with, and, and, and you know... Can, can I just say I think that's totally impractical. It could be a rush tomorrow morning from four people to want to be the next four. You know, anybody watching this webcast that desperately wants one of these is going to be knocking on the door first thing in the morning. So how are you going to say you can and you can't? I don't know. Um, personally, I think, you know, eight would be a reasonable number, and I, I couldn't see that scenario. Um, I think it would be manageable to extend the pilot uh, to that. Um, I think it would be sensible, rather than sort of trying to deal with it in a this kind of in, uh, committee forum, to sort of schedule a workshop in a couple of months and we can sort of talk through how things have gone and um, the, the pros and cons and so on and look to sort of uh, report back a, uh, to make a final decision on this in, in the summer. You know, I hear, I hear what everyone's said, you know, I understand the concerns and... OK, let, let's try and wrap this up now then. So, have we... Got a proposal, a firm proposal from anyone? I, or I make shall a firm restate proposal now. that we continue with a pilot, pro a limited pilot project on the basis suggested by Mr. Cornell, because if we do not do that, we simply will not have the information. Putting in the planning review will not tell us anything. Okay, so to draw this conclusion, your proposal is that we continue with a limited pilot study at the revised, suggested revised fees per the papers and that based upon that study, a further report comes to this committee for a final decision in due course. I, I was saying limited because I think it could be impossible to control it between seven and nine based upon a suggested eight. A, a limited study in the order of eight of four further cases. I think we need the further information. We really do. We. we Okay, yeah, but I'm just trying to refine this proposal and then we're going to go to the vote and just decide something once and for all. So, Mr Chairman, is that not option one that you're struggling with? Up to a maximum of eight and a continuation of... And then yeah, it's a modified version of option one. I just think the fee bit needs to be clear, that it's the revised fees per this report rather than those that have been charged to date. Yes? yes. Can, I, can I make a suggestion? Right. P perhaps you would be kind enough to we read back what you think we've captured as that proposal. Okay. Um, I'm, t I'm just taking a, a option one, uh, that the committee approves the further investigation of PPAs up to a maximum of eight and a continuation of the pilots. So in other words, you've got the eight plus the, the, the three that are kind of in the... No. Four plus... Uh, but one's already gone to committee, so... Well, that's part of the feedback. Four. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, four, including the... Ex uh, okay, so for the further investigation of PPAs, up to a maximum of eight, including the current four pilots. Right, okay, and a continuation of the pilot. Uh, the final fee, st fee structure 
as per the as per the revised fee in the report and a further report be referred back to the committee or so we were talking about a working group weren't we it, it would eventually have to come back to yes, the committee for the working group uh, that, that updates be given to a working group uh, workshop okay to workshop um, before returning before, to this committee for final being, decision yeah, before yes okay I think right. we've got that mr. Chapman I did promise I'd take you and then we we'll move to a vote Right, I'm going to move this to the vote, unless any... So, who's proposing that? That's Councillor English. Nobody's seeking to amend that, so I'm looking for a seconder. Councillor Wilby. Those in favour? Those against? And there are no abstentions, but that motion is carried. Thank you, members. Let's move on. Our last item of business for this evening, agenda item 15, to be found at page 212, planning service review update. Mr Cornell. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, very briefly then, the, the report says it all, um, but obviously this is a follow-up from the report I brought to this committee back in November. It just shows the progress that we've um, made. We're sort of on track to hit the timescales I set out at that point. We've um, procured the external advisor to undertake the exercise. They, they've begun now. They've started the engagement processes with, with staff. And probably the, the bit to sort of draw your attention to is that the, the, the sessions with members have now been diarised for the, the first uh, week in April. And I think you, you would have all received contact. So things are moving ahead well. Um, but I'll happily take any further questions that there might be. Councillor Mrs Springer. Um, it's not a question, it's just a comment really. Um, paragraph 2.5 just says that the methodology is system thinking, which means that all of their analysis is from a customer's perspective. I'd like to know, does that just mean the customer is the applicant, or does that customer include members of the public who may have differing views of planning, the planning process and the planning system? So is it, is it actually going to represent the, 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 the residents as well? That, that was a yes then. Okay, <laughs> right. Any other questions? One question from me then. Um, we're hanging an awful lot on this planning review. And I just sense that there might be lots of things that we're... So cutting to the chase, is there anything that's being held up that we should be getting on with that's being held because of this planning review? Uh, no, I think we've got various projects that are sort of running ahead as, as they would do ordinarily. So to my mind, there's no projects that have been delayed as a result of it. Perhaps the only thing that this committee sort of took a decision on was the Transport Operators Group, which was a, yeah, that's a to decision be wrapped up that with we, this. Yes. everyone felt would be best dealt with within the review. But other than that... You know, I may be wrong. You know, others may okay. say differently, but, but I wouldn't say We're not holding so. up recruitment no. or project work mm. or... Um, just on the topic of recruitment, you know, it has been a difficult year in terms of recruitment, but those difficulties have been budgetary, not related to this. Mr Jarman. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, Chairman. This, the second paragraph of 2.8, which presumably should be 2.9, deals with the budgetary constraints, which I think you're referring to, Chairman. And whilst I've got the chance, um, um, I'm not going to reopen the previous um, discussion, but obviously the government themselves have decided to increase planning fees by 20% for... Um, uh, local planning authorities that aren't poorly performing, which we 
certainly aren't. But I, I am, as you alluded to, Chairman, I'm very conscious that that's a hike in the fee. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a hike in terms of income to this council compared with, say, the current business year we're in. Because obviously planning applications can go down. They're not a constant. Oh, okay. Absolutely. And the, tw yes. and the added 20% may mean that we break even, so to speak. Right. Sobering thoughts. Uh, we're simply asked to note this report for now. Is that noted, members? And then I'm pleased to say that the business of the evening is concluded. Thank you to everyone for their time, attendance, patience and contribution. And the meeting is now closed. Thank you. <laughs>